I think of it as like nutrients and, and microbes and stuff like that. Like Scott, I think of you as someone who like eats books and does research and then you poop out digestible, intelligent, coherent thought bites for the community. Yes. That's, that's actually been my role the entire time. People, <laughs> I think the... Uh... And, and, and shockingly, a lot of people don't want to eat your poo, but I've been eating it since day one. There's no, let's just clarify, there's no feces involved, but no, that's totally what happened. Like, you know, I come from Southern California from a pretty uh, diverse neighborhood and, you know, some of the homies from high school went really hard on the uh, indoor OG cultivation. And so I used to come along and check it out and it would be me and like a bunch of homies and I'd be like, well, why is that happening? And someone would be like, the plants need the proteins, eh? And I'd be like, the plants need the proteins. They're like, the plants need the proteins, eh? And I'm like, why are we doing this? Plants need the proteins. And I'm like, none of you motherfuckers know any reason why we're doing stuff. And so, I uh, no, no disrespect, but like they were doing a great job, but like nobody knew why. And my compulsion and obsession was the why. Like, I, I have to know why I'm doing something if I'm gonna tinker with it or else it's not worth my effort. And so and I would it just actually works. Yeah, it has to work. So I just would, you know, try to figure out why something was happening or what was the new like, what did the nutrient even do? What does nitrogen even do? What does potassium even do? And how do we solve these problems? And that just carrying on that same energy brought me here, I guess, trying to figure out problems and digesting complicated I, science data. Yeah. I, I loved learning about the minerals and the spray and the minerals from you and uh, Sam from Soilscape, like that whole mineral attitude or doing that and spraying is often like you were doing down at that nursery. Like, I, I mean, I, I, if more people would do that and like even the big facilities, I'd like to somehow like slide that in there, you know, at least I run that final mineral spray. Over. You do? Yeah. 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 I mean, no, Sam had me check it out too. And I needed it for my hill because I have such an aggressive wind that I theorized that I wasn't getting calcium transport adequately through the roots because the environment was so aggressive. And I was just like, you know what? I said, I think I really have to run a foliar program to offset my environmental issues. And I talked to Sam. He's like, Kev, I got this killer program. I want you to run it. And so I ran it last year. And I mean, the, the, the plants have never looked so good. I had so few issues. It just kept them on point, you know, and it, it is, it's a, it's a gift to be able to be around people who are working on all the fringes. That's why I always love hanging out with you because I'm like, you, you've been touching the, ho the hoops since before people knew what hoops were. Well, so, so can we stay on this as a, as kind of a coherent topic, which is uh, yeah. sp spraying minerals? Yeah, phylo, the, the, they call it a, I think it was a phyloscape program that Sam had over at, um, a soilscape out of Arcata. And it's just really a good comprehensive mineral nutrient spray program. And what I went into it for is that, you know, my situation is I have such a rough environment up the hill that the finished product is excellent, but I never get the growth out of the plants that I wanted because they're working so hard to, to work in that environment. And so I theorized that I needed to go into leaf foliar development so that I could get around having to have the plant go through the metabolic process from the root zone up. And one day, uh, Sam gives me a call and says, hey, we have this beautiful program coming out. I'd love to talk to you. So I went down the shop. I took a look at an operation that he had been using it on. And the quality of that, it was on an indoor that he was shooting. And it was stunning. And so I said, look, let me, let me run it on my hill. So I, I picked the program up. And I had the best run last year. And like I said, when I ran those varieties, on that white label, there was at least 25 farms that ran the same exact plants that I ran. And I had over of, uh, anyone in California using those varieties, I had the highest uh, terp levels and highest cannabinoid levels. And I had zero problems with the plants growing. And I used beneficial insects in terms of inoculation so that I had um, releases throughout the season so that if I had any problems come in, I would have a a bank of beneficials to do the job for me because I didn't I don't like to use any kind of spray especially in tough environments sprays are tough on leaf surface and if the leaves are going through the beat and they take up on the hill the plant stresses out because of it and that foliar program 
gave me incredible growth. The end product came out beautifully. It came out so good that I picked up enough to do the 18,000 square foot this year. So I'm going to run it a second season because I had such success with that foliar program. I, I, I believe in it because Scott turned me on to it and I got some clones that had a little spider mites or whatever issue. And the first, you know, like we were talking about earlier, we're really spraying for war all the time. But if more people were spraying for health, they would actually see a better result in the plant health. And secondly, the bugs don't like getting sprayed with just plain water anyway, if you do it every day. And there was a certain point where I was trying to mimic what Scott was doing at a nursery where in the evening time I was spraying like five, six nights a week with a different mineral throughout those whole programs. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't done any soil analysis or water tests. I just said, fuck it, I'm going to spray minerals and have fun with it. And one of them was just, one of the things he had me spraying was cocoa and aloe. And so, I mean, the plants just loved it and the bugs hated it and they went away. So I never sprayed any type of, uh, you know, pesticide. I just sprayed for mm -hmm. health the whole time and the plants got better. The bugs didn't like it. And it was just this win-win situation. And I feel like that can be done more at scale. It's just hard to implement and get people to jump onto that, you know, swallow that pill because we're so forced into the IPM program of actually the war path. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the health has to be part, you know, has to be there too, obviously. But, you know, I think we could make a big turn in some of these, you know, bigger facilities if we could incorporate some more health sprays. Oh, guaranteed. I fully agree. You have to be proactive. And for me, it was every, it was three times a week. So Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And I, I would either get in at four o'clock in the morning or I could shoot in the evening too. So it had time to, to penetrate in. And it, it made in such a difference that the people who've been up the hill prior and saw the plants using that treatment couldn't believe it because we've always historically had transplant issues in terms of just slower growth. And I know that I'll never get giant plants up there because I have such a wind load all the time that when I run my test crops down low, say at 550 feet at my spot, or I run it up at my farm at, you know, 2,300 feet. I get, you know, two to three times bigger plant down below. Same mix, same media, same operator, same cultivar, only difference environment. So I know that that particular place has an impact on the plant. But when we utilized that foliar nutrition program to, to just assist with the plant's uptake so it didn't have to work so hard to pull it through the vascular system from below up, the plants just exploded and, and my friends that came up and saw it, they were just like, what did you do? And I mean, it was so dramatic. And then the quality of the flower was phenomenal. And when I got the, when I got hit up by the company and they said, Hey, they said, you just clean house on your terps and your cannabis, your cannabinoids. And I said, well, nice. So not only was the plant healthy, but because it was healthier, it was able to actually go through its chemical process and generate what we want which is those desirable chemicals. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, that's what we want, so, without so, a doubt. So just quickly, Kevin, you mentioned frequency, which is three times a week. Scott, can you talk about kind of what minerals are in the mixes that you're recommending? And then do those, uh, does, do the, do, do you change it based on different stages of plant growth? Like you'd have different mixes, uh, during the early stages, veg and so on. Yeah. So, um, I guess to further clarify the kit that they're talking about is, yeah, it's defined as the Phyloscape. That's the name of the product. And there's like 11 or 12 bottles in the kit, some powders, some liquids, and it's made by Soilscape Solutions out in Arcata, um, which I'm, I, you know, I, one of the things that I say is like this kit that Sam came out with, I will say we'll look back in history and say this kit was one of the more dramatic impactors on the organic sector. Um, he assures me that everything in there except for one product is all organic and it's used with amino acids. It does look like chemicals. You know, some of the stuff's blue because copper's blue. And so it does look like chemical nutrients, but I trust <laughs> I trust Sam that all of them except just the nitrogen phosphate product are organic, um, but it gives you the flexibility of hydroponics, which is what I like. And so the standard kit has two recipes that you do three times a week and alternate it. 
Um, that has worked everywhere we've used it. I use the kit in a little bit different way. Um, I personally use it as a toolkit for hitting ideal math numbers. Um, and that does change slightly by the farm. Um, I also don't use every product in the kit um, because we have some other products that I use in substitution. But in essence, what Sam's kit allows me to do is you can formulate a full year nutrient that has ideal values of almost every main nutrient. And I have not seen anything else that compares to that capability at all. There's nothing on the planet that I think gives you those capabilities. And so we use them everywhere. We use them with the hydroponic farms. We use them at the living soil farms. Um, I think every single commercial farm I work with at least gets a sample kit. Um, and so, which is a funny deal. I think it shows how much I believe in that product is that by definition, Sam is an exact competitor of me. We both make soil, we both do consulting, we both do mineral analysis, and we both do biological analysis. And I enjoy that kit so much that I send my competitors to his office to order products. Like, you know, and that's, I think that's more, I think that speaks to Sam as well. You know, I don't feel threatened by him and I trust him and I respect him. So, um, so far, nothing's good from turning our clients to him as well. So, uh, which I think is rare in the industry. You well, know, and person. shout out to people who make good products that yeah. support this this industry and what we're trying yeah. to do and mm -hmm. achieve. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That that kit's extremely powerful. So, I guess to more clearly define, um, you know, I, I more go for a full fertility approach every chance I get because I'm trying to be simple and scalable. Uh, most farms that hire us have an ultimate goal of allowing to cross state lines, whether that means um, they invest further in their own business and, and go across the states, or they find outside investment, they create set, whatever that means to them. Most farms that we work with are ultimately looking to expand and take advantage of the open market or the open borders when that comes in the United States. And in order to do that, you need to have scalable techniques. And so far, most farms that we've worked with, there's you know, one, two, or three key components that makes that system work. And you can't scale yourself. You need to scale processes that are repeatable and easy and predictable. And so you know, we take an extremely simplified approach to cultivation and try to just provide full fertility at each step that we can while monitoring bi biological activity in the soil. And when we do that, then your cultivation experience is actually scalable. And so what, it's, what it starts to do is it, it simplifies the process so that any employee can execute it and, it. and we choose process that have really low volatility and really low chances of going haywire so that it keeps it within the, the comfort of health and then you know, the way that you can then scale that to multiple properties is that the initial analysis is being moved to a data point. If we take all the data points of a farm, I can sit down and aggregate all the information of multiple facilities and identify where the problems will be. That's the biggest obstacle to scale right now is if your strategy for cultivation is spraying everything three times a week and you keep adding more square footage, how many you know, at what point does that become the breaking point? And so Sarah and I have learned to take key data points of soil nutrition, um, you know, the nutrition of the feeds and foliar, and then the populations of the organisms in the soil. And by taking a look at those data sets, you can make cl very clear correlations as to where the problems will be, and you can focus those efforts. And then you can either determine is the reason for the dysfunction a cultural practice, like are employees doing something that's leading to problems, or is there an imbalance problem that we need to correct? And still that allows you to then maintain those one, two or three key, key em employees that make the facility run, but they can then scale their focus. And I, I based on what I've seen from you know, very intensely watching cannabis operations, because even from the first day I went into a cannabis growing facility, I was watching it in extreme interest of how to make it successful. And so I've kind of watched these obstacles of scale. And even in those early black market days of buddies trying to scale, 
the same problems that my buddies ran into going from a couple houses to a 20,000 square foot building are the same obstacles that every cultivator everywhere is running into. And you, there just becomes a certain point where you can't do everything the way that you've always done it. And that's tripping up anybody that's going up in any scale, whether that's from four to 12 lights or from four facilities to 26 facilities. You know, Sarah and I have, you know, provided advice and consulting to farms with as many as, um, I think the largest group was 26 different properties. Um, and we, ha we have to provide solutions that can be emailed to 26 properties and come up with something that will work. And those same strategies apply to a tent grower. It's the same systemic imbalances that lead to headaches, you know. And that's just moving the ball to prevention, you know, and getting to the cause of things when we talk about these IPM strategies versus, um, you know, always chasing your tail and spraying, spraying to kill. We always say spray to hill, not to kill. Um, if you can have, if you can help it at all. Um, yeah. Which is what Eric was talking about. Yeah. Like, and that's what er Eric's really championing that phrase. And that's the thing. It's like, everybody's mindset is what do I do to kill these aphids? And, you know, from our standpoint, now that accountants are involved counting everything about our process and everything that the cultivator does to determine if it's financially viable. Well, one of those things is sending employees to spray something. And so those employees can either spray a pesticide or like in Kevin's experience, he sprayed a foliar nutrient that led to more terpenes, more potency, more saleability, higher velocity in the market, all those things. Like, you but know, the bugs hate it too. You got to remind them that the bugs mm -hmm. don't like that. They don't want the plant to get healthy and they don't want to get <laughs> hit with water even. Exactly. Yeah, it's like what, what how, how, do, um, how do tornadoes affect reproduc reproduction rates of humans? How do hurricanes affect reproduction rates of humans? Like we can see it in our own life. Like, you know, babies slow down a little bit when there's a major catastrophe and a wave coming over the, the shore. And it's like, I can only imagine that the same thing is happening to a bug. Like if you go in there three, four times a week and spray anything, you're at least pissing them off and killing a couple eggs, you know? Like you might as well spray something that can increase yield, spray something that can increase health, spray something that can increase quality markers that will um, ease your product selling on the market. You know, Oregon and Washington, all these markets that are completely destroyed by percentage points is really unfortunate, but it's really shown us a lot about our process and what leads to higher numbers. Because if that's the focus, that's what we're being put to work on. Like, how do we increase potency numbers? Well, you definitely have to decrease aphid problems. That's the first step, you know, and then provide supplement that increases those numbers. What's well, the overall this, support uh, of the plant? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The nuts of uh, replicating a natural system. You were mentioning it earlier. It's only six plants that are being contested and you know the bugs are doing their job you know the insects and the diseases are there to break down that plant material that's not thriving that's the purpose and point and that's why those those things occur in the first place as as we all agree and so watching watching that develop and as the industry moves more towards a greater understanding of what's going on on leaf surfaces around roots you know understanding how to um that the process of um you know, individually picking out a specific, you know, endo or ecto mycorrhizal fungi and, and choosing whether or not, you know, your company is able to grow all of that up in a vat and make it into a, you know, a uniform product that people can apply. You know, that's a completely different type of system than understanding the, the minutia of, of being able to figure out your own compost pile, right? And knowing like the conditions of the the place that you're at and the different materials that you have um, to create, you know, new soil, new materials to be able to feed the plant is sure, surely it does take longer and surely there are different types of facilities than others. But, you know, if, if you're dealing with plants that are um, not healthy or sick, you know, or they don't have fans, you know, they don't have the right amount of air circulation. There's like a very, there's lots of things going on that be, can be causing these issues in the first place and you just want to watch out before they get started. Thank you.